Hello everyone, uh, I'm Joanna Penn and this is the Alliance of Independent Authors November 2016 uh, Q&A and I'm here with Orna Ross. Hi Orna. Hi Joanna. This is actually our December Q&A. Oh sorry, <laughs> December, like tomorrow's December or something, like we're right at the end. But you missed last month because I was away. So we can't manage without you. <laughs> it's kind of a double, it's a double whammy. And, and as befitting a double whammy, we have so many questions I've had to curate today's uh, selection to try and answer sort of the most uh, wide uh, set of questions for everyone. But um, as is very important, um, Orna and I talk about writing, but we're also authors and it's very important that we share what we're doing um, creatively so you know we're not just talking about it, we're doing. So Orna, what, is, what have you been up to um, and you know, what are your uh, creative updates and your ally updates uh, for the last couple of months? Yeah, um, well, Ally is finally out of teaching season, so we are um, winding up in one way towards Christmas because everybody is thinking about the busiest time of the year for book sales, um, and so that's where author's heads are, and we're kind of supporting people in the background with all sorts of information and knowledge around all of that we had a very interesting um day with amazon in london uh, last week at the amazon academy and um a number of our members came along to that some people traveled in for it but um yeah no more teaching now until digital book world in january so um i think a lot of people use this time as well to write and, and to get stuck mm -hmm. into their own writing i know i do so i've been working on the go create a series still there and putting together the club that will support that so knee deep in tech at the moment which is never my favorite place to be <laughs> and um yeah just just generally kind of getting on with lots of writing i love this time of year um, i'm one of the people that actually loves the whole christmas thing but i also like just that kind of dip in activity that comes now and a bit of a rest and all of that kind of thing what about you Oh, well, bef before I mention something, I think it's actually really important that we talk about that uh, ebb and flow, like you mentioned your Go Creative books, which you're getting out. And if people have been listening to this for the last couple of years, you've been talking about the Go Creative books well, for this time. Yeah, they came out, uh, I put them out before and actually withdrew them. And I have talked about that here on the show before and and more widely about the whole journey with them. Um, you know, just moving too fast. And then I explain mm. actually in the first book in the series, uh, I really feel like a whole thing needed to happen in my life and everything had to come together in a way for that, for me to actually be, is worthy the right word? Just to really get on top of the material in the way that um, I needed to. Yeah, so, well, I, what I wanted to say was it was this ebb and flow of different tasks throughout the year and the creative year and the ebbs and flows in our own life are really important to acknowledge because so often the sort of indie pace is described as a sort of constant output and that's just not true i don't well it's not true in my creative life it's not true in your creative life and you know this time of year like you're saying i mean i'm really really planning for 2017 and i'm having more downtime because i'm we don't really do christmas uh, unlike you and and i think it's really great for people to hear that that it is ebb and flow and there's darkness as well like i'm a shadow person so the darkness time is really great for me and the sound of rain and like I'm much more productive in this darker Saturnalia type period so That's yeah really interesting yeah I, I think because there is one business model in the indie world which is and it's also actually in trade publishing world uh, for certain genre fiction writers where it's just bang 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 you know book 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 and um, that is the model you just produce book after book after book and it's constantly about keeping your word count up and and you know people who write like that and who work to that business model it's very regular in the sense that you know it's six books a year it's eight books a year and it, the pace doesn't tend to drop and i think indie sometimes make the mistake of thinking that's how you have to do it and of course it isn't we're indie we can do it whatever way it suits our own and you have to go with your own 
uh, creative flow, including making the mistakes that I was talking about earlier on and riding that out and staying with it, not letting it go, staying there until you get, you know, get it the way you want it. And yeah, I, I find it fascinating. I can't hear enough about uh, other author stories because I think what the self-publishing revolution has done is has is shown that there are many different ways to do this and uh, you know in the same way that the old notion of the author in the ivory tower who doesn't want to do any business related stuff at all is does not apply to all authors neither does that model of relentlessly you know producing a work i mean hats off to those who can do it and mm. do it it's an incredible achievement and I, I honestly don't know how people manage to sustain that pace. I know I couldn't, and I really admire people who can, but it's not for everybody and it doesn't have to be, I suppose that's what we're trying to say. Mm, yeah, exactly. The other thing I wanna bring up, like just as a sort of thinking about what's happened in the last couple of months is of course um, the American election. And we're not gonna talk about politics. What I want to talk about and ask you about in this segment before we do Q and A is, uh, dealing and coping creatively with emotional change when things seem outside of our control because there's so much that many people want to say on either side or on any, somewhere on the spectrum. Um, you, you're a, I guess, a mentor in creativity and it's you know, helped you in ups and downs in your life. So what would your message be to people who still feel like things are just out of control what can we do to anchor ourselves i guess during this difficult time wow <laughs> that's a big one i didn't expect that q in the q a <laughs> i think it's a big question that's far more important than many other things <laughs> yeah, no it absolutely is i mean it is a it's a very interesting change in our world i think and it has taken the, the liberal left, uh, which, you know, a lot of writers fall into that category, not all by any means, but a lot of writers do fall into that category and it has taken them completely by surprise. And perhaps it shouldn't, you know, perhaps that is a sign of complacency that kind of set in over the last number of years. I think at a time like this, you know, um, when you really don't know what to do, the thing to do is to hold the space and hold the questions. But I think it has to come back to what you know, you yourself are doing. It's very easy to sort of look across the space and it's the same in writing, you know, to look across the space and to point fingers and to say there is the problem over there. But actually we all co-created this world we have and we all decide what we're going to do with the energy we've been given, with the values that we hold and how we shape our lives around that is very important. And I, I think people who would prefer if um, Mr. Trump had not been elected, need, we need to ask ourselves how it happened and not, I've heard some really worrying things, you know, uh, within the author community where the people who vote for Trump are being called all sorts of awful names, you know, and and a complete supposition that anybody who, who is a creative is going to automatically vote one way and may not, you know, may not vote another way. All that kind of easy um, jumping to solutions and, uh, you know, deciding what the answer is before you've even asked the question. So I suppose what I'd be arguing for is that uh, that great line of the uh, poet Rilke in his letters to a young poet where he said, live the questions, just hold yourself in the place of the question first of all, and let the answers rise rather than rushing to have, have all the answers at this point. And I know that for some people that just sounds like a, um, a, a, a cop out, but actually it's one of the hardest things in the world to do I think it is and that um I just wanted to say you know I've been really really busy and I have all kinds of things going on and 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 the most important thing I think you know especially if you become trapped into a social media cycle which many people are or a blogging cycle or an argumentative cycle is come back to what why we're doing this in the first place um so the other day i i got up and i had um i had three whole hours which was amazing just thinking and researching about my next series and uh it was just such i unplugged completely and i've got my notebook you know i've got my moleskins you can see some of them behind me and i just 
spent time in like my fantasy world and it was very nourishing just to do that so I think to just remind people if if you're getting all that angst and worked up at whichever side of the spectrum you are is to come back to the page and to come back to your own creative practice especially over Christmas too a very stressful time uh, for many people to just spend time every day whether it's with a notebook or whatever just thinking and creating and doing whatever we do because we do this um i think that's brilliant advice and i think sometimes at times like this when where political tensions run very high creators can be made feel that you know what we do is trivial and mm -hmm. not important but actually it's really really, it's really important. important and ultimately you know generally outlives political cycles which come and go and yeah you know it may seem bizarre that you know writing a series about zombies or whatever may in fact be the best thing you can do for the world but i actually firmly believe it is <laughs> it is because everybody needs to escape like people need escapism at difficult times so yeah. and also because when you're making stuff you're not getting into conflict when you're you know if you're in conflict whether it's with the idea of a trump presidency or another person you're not actually in creative mode you cannot be in conflict conflict mode if you're making stuff you're making stuff and the mind is open and you're receptive and things are coming through you if you're full of ideas and and preconceived notions and judgments and opinions then you're not in creative mode so uh, you know the more openness and receptivity we have in the world i think the better excellent um okay uh, i'm getting a bit of an echo have you got a headset or something because i can hear myself in in the okay yeah. uh, maybe it all in maybe it won't come through on the recording it's just i can hear myself so that's okay i'll just carry on um so just as a, a little update for me i was away in america and then in israel and uh that i was away nearly a month and that whole time was pretty kind of major in my creative life and my business life and um i can't really you know i share a lot on my on my own podcast so i won't share too much here but i really am looking at sort of the next level and um being more serious about print which many of you will know i have not been serious about um, forever. I just haven't been interested. So now really considering that uh, even the dreaded ISBN discussion, <laughs> I, I will even be going that way. However, I have people have been asking me, you know, would I have done this earlier? Do I recommend doing this earlier? So I've got 21 books now and looking at, at setting up an imprint, buying ISBNs, doing print through Ingram Spark. Um, I'm quite happy that I didn't do it earlier because I'm at the point now where I have money from book sales to invest in more books, you know, and the money that you have to potentially invest in print can, you know, and, and you don't make as much money in print. So I'm actually really happy I'm doing it now, um, you know, and I wasn't able to focus on it before because I was busy building my business. So if you're on book one, I wouldn't necessarily recommend like setting up a small press and doing print first, um, you know, plus a lot of people don't write more than one book or more than three books. It's not, this is not something everybody does. So it, we all come at things at different angles and some people listening will be like, well, I set up print on book one and that's great. We're just at different places um, in what we care about and how we make a living. So there is no right answer, as you said, right? Absolutely not. And, um, you know, audio and print, whether you decide to go audio, you were, I think, maybe unusual, but I'm not sure. Um, I see some people doing this more now that audio is the second format and then print is the third format. For most people, I mean, a lot of indies come in thinking print, you know, thinking they're going to make a print book first. And then everybody, you know, who's been in the game says, no, stop, make an ebook first. Um, it, it just makes so much more sense. So for most indies, I think it's, it's E first, P then, then audio. But uh, you can very validly argue for the other way around. Um, I just do think it ebook first is mm. so that's definitely almost universally applicable unless you've got a really good reason to to put one of the other two formats ahead. You know, in an individual sort of set of circumstances, I think it's it should be ebook first. And yeah, it's interesting to see you go on your print journey and the way you're 
approaching it. Uh, I mean, a lot of people do print just as an extra, you know, to have. Mm. And I know you always had. You always, I've always done. Do yeah, I've always done create space, but yeah, yeah. But uh, the idea, and then the other thing is that you know the whole world of print has not yet caught up with indies so mm. you're coming into it and um, people are beginning to take print seriously at this time it's only in the next year or two that we're going to have a, an ecosystem that will actually make sense financially because anybody who has been selling books through the bookstores as an indie you know not anybody but but really the vast majority of people have not been making any money and it's a huge amount of time and effort print um, distribution through bookstores. They are not set up for the small person, they're set up for, for big corporate mm. publishing. So I think it's a good time, it is good timing um, on both sides. Yeah, well, and, and you with your um, Secret Rose project, I mean, that's what has interested me. So I'm, uh, I'm putting it out there at the end of 2016 that the end of 2017 I want to do a special print run of notebooks so like creative journals um, because that's that out of all the print things I have apart from the full color image books that I have are notebooks and I buy so many notebooks that that's kind of what I want to do as a special project so that's why I'm interested it's getting into the more interesting print ideas um, but also I should just update that um, my novel my thriller novel end of days is with my editor and that's coming out in January so I am still writing thrillers just so everybody knows <laughs> That won't change, not, no. not too quickly anyway. No, that certainly will not change. Um, okay, so you also had a couple of things about some offers that you want to Yeah, um, a couple of nice uh, partner member offers. So for um, Readsy, which is a, a marketplace um, for designers, editors and services that an indie author might need, has made a very nice offer to Ally members just um, a, a full developmental edit worth $2,000 up to $2,000 and two runners up prizes of a book design package worth $500. And um, all you have to do is go, if you actually, the easiest way to find your way there is just Google uh, read the offer to Ally and then you'll find your way to the page and that will bring you to the offer and there's only about six hours left i think it closes um or four hours left it closes at midnight tonight and uh, for our professional members ingram spark is going to be doing a catalog which is going into this part of the change that's happening in the print world a catalog that's going into all the uk bookstores in um January and um, anybody who would like to be included in that if you can just drop me uh, an, an email just to say that you would it's for professional members and it's orna at allianceindependentauthors.org and that will be the first time that actually a bookstore catalogue will have gone out with um, so many indies in it so that's yeah I'm trying to get in for that so that's my goal is to get end of days in that catalogue <laughs> Definitely. No, that'd be great. And um, it's, a, it's a milestone for our Open Up to Indie Authors campaign. So we're really happy about that. And that campaign is going to be really picking up speed in January, February. Um, there's lots of things coming coming on stream where we're going to see a lot more indie action uh, in places where we haven't been before. So we're really happy. Indie action. Woohoo. <laughs> <laughs> <Her pal. laughs> oh, power rangers that's us okay uh so there we go that was a long introduction but i thought those questions were important and it's my job to ask you orna the hard questions so that everyone can benefit from your wisdom <laughs> um okay so let us so Ralph, this is a great question. Ralph says, I'd appreciate some advice on how to assert copyright if you are intending to self-publish under a pseudonym. How does the pseudonym link to the real life legal person of the author? And a sort of subsequent question, what if you want to keep your real identity secret? So of course you could put the copyright in your real name, but then people would actually see that your name is on the copyright. So how does that work? Yeah, um, well, not a lot of people know this, but Orna Ross is a pseudonym. <laughs> so people do pseudonyms at all sorts of different levels. I mean, I have so many people now who know me as Orna, it's almost become a second legal name, but it isn't. It is a pseudonym. And uh, it came about because my publisher at the time recommended that I should have a short phonetic in English was how it was described to me name because my own name was far too Irish and hard to for people to read and understand uh, especially in the UK so 
um, I adopted that name at that time and it became the name that I, I've become known as throughout my business life really so my friends and family call me a, a completely different name so other people do it quite differently you know they they're they have three or four names and everybody knows their real name and and some people completely hide behind their pseudonym and it is um a complete secret you know nobody knows what, what their real name is copyright can go into the pseudonym or the legal name there's absolutely no connection in terms of uh, you know legal responsibility or anything like that your legal name is your legal name there's no need to change anything by deed poll it's come it's sort of a a, a writer's right that's recognized it's been a very common thing all through the ages for all sorts of various reasons people have taken pseudonyms so it really is very simple you just decide how much or how little you want to use the name and you know just use it as you wish and um, you're completely covered legally in, in and in every other way however if under that name you commit a libel or any other legal offense it's you <laughs> they'll come after not your name not your pseudonym so you know you're completely responsible for everything that is done it by that pseudonym if you know what i mean you as the the person is completely responsible so um does that yeah and i think just to make it clear like when you set up an account at amazon or um i can't remember about kobo or any of the other sites but certainly on amazon there are three names there's um your name your legal name for your bank account has to be one name your um the name you would like them to call you your author name is a completely separate name and you can have a publisher name like an imprint as well so there are these different fields technically so you can just use different names when you publish um so that hopefully that answers that question okay um a couple of questions on rights. So Eamon says, I recently received an email inquiry about Korean translation rights from a certain group in Korea. I'm unsure if this is real or should be treated as spam. Um, you know, how do, how do we know basically? Because this is happening more and more. So we don't speak Korean. We can't even Google the website in Korean potentially because it's not in, the, in our language. Um, how do you benefit from these types of of opportunities but still protect yourself from potential scams yeah well i think it's one of the things that the alliance exists to do is to kind of do that work on behalf of our members if they are at a loss and they don't know the particular company that Eamon mentioned is in fact a legitimate company they're quite well known in the rights world because they are very active in reaching out to indies so if you have a successful book, they're likely to come along at some point. And we know a number of Indies who have made small, but, you know, fine, perfectly adequate uh, deals with that company. But the, the wider question is, is, you know, stands, which is that we can't possibly know all the agents and sub agents and small publishers all over the world. And if you are approached, how do you know? So it's one of the things that we do for people a lot is, kind of, you know, they say, I've, I've had a, an email from so-and-so, are they real? Um, if you have an agent, of course, an agent will do that job for you and if the if the deal is reasonable um you know and if it is a legitimate legitimate operation your agent should be able to improve on that deal so it's really important to say that anybody and again this is something we we do obviously toby mundy does the the bigger deals if you like but on small deals where there you know there isn't a lot of margin in it but there can be a significant difference in in the terms or the reversion clause or some of the other clauses then we would um help people out and you know have doubled advances in some cases and, and definitely got better terms for people so two things to say first of all don't sign anything kind of willy-nilly without knowing what you're signing never do that so it's better to let an opportunity go than mm. to sign something away when you don't know what it is and secondly just you know you are an alliance member do ask ask for the help that you're entitled to as a member and and um, take a look at our book um, how authors sell publishing rights because there's a lot of information in there that will give you sort of basic ideas 
because there comes a point at which rights become important to an indie and um and you know we see more and more people now beginning to move into that space mm. no it's interesting like i had um i don't know if i told you about this i had a uh, somebody ask about uh, uh, one of my characters licensing a character for a game and well, I think I did tell you and um, and I was like you know a couple of months ago I'd have been like yeah great let's do it I'd love to put my character in your game and because I've been learning about rights it was like okay well if they want that one character what happens if somebody else wants the whole world or wants to make a game with the whole world I've what if then I can't do that deal because I've complicated the rights so my my instinct was I don't want to license this one tiny part of my world because there's a potential later to do a bigger deal and you know at the moment I'm kind of feeling like actually the longer we wait the better things are potentially going to be because like you say these things are starting to emerge and what I fully expect to happen is the indie movement and the change in publishing will reach other countries and then there will be more potential for collaboration for you know lots of more exciting things to come and if you sign away your rights now at a point where literally we don't know what's going to happen with virtual reality with all these other technologies that are coming on board um, my instinct now is to wait uh, which I know can be very hard for people, but I actually, I think time is coming. <laughs> and if Joanna Penn can wait, anyone can wait. Well, I know, because I am <laughs> terrible at waiting. But um, I do, I really think that this is now, I, I think I've reached that point where, you know, there's that curve of knowing, like you, you, you're all enthusiastic because you don't know what you don't know. And then you realize what you don't know. And you're like, oh my goodness, I'm at that point of knowing what I don't know. And now I need to go up the ramp of knowing more so that I can, I guess, be more empowered. And that's part of our mission, right? Is to empower authors to make better decisions and to do better deals and to create more um, because they know more. So yeah. Completely. And rights is a very interesting area because it's overlooked. I mean, every publishing house has a rights department and there's a reason for that. So each indie should have, you know, the right, a rights department as well. And it's not easy at the moment. And again, there will be more of an ecosystem for this, I, I would predict, in about three years time. You know, there is already the fledgling things beginning to grow up. It will never be a neat world. It's mm. always going to be. I mean, you're talking about the whole world and you're talking about a string of possible rights. And as you say, a completely unfolding tech and um, virtual reality and all of, you know, computer, all sorts of things are going to be there in 10 years that we simply cannot visualize now, which was not the case when people came up with sub rights contracts you know 75 and 100 years ago they just the contracts don't actually cover what is now possible so the basic principles remain the same though as they were 100 years ago and will be the same 100 years hence which is you know the rights buyer is going to be trying to take as much rights as possible from you and it is your job to try and limit uh, as much as possible the format the uh, the time frame everything you know to mm. the the work with the territory you try and keep it as small as possible they try to make it as big as possible it's a negotiation and that's another skill that indies need to get if you're going to enter into this world the ability to pitch and to negotiate so um exciting it's a very exciting world with lots and lots of potential but it's not an easy one to to grab hold of and it's not something that if you're just starting out on self-publishing mm. just unwind the tape of the last yeah. five minutes because it doesn't really apply until you get to a certain point yeah uh, so i'm gonna unwind with a uh, newbie question uh robin says i'm close to purchasing my first uh, pu purchasing i'm close to publishing my first novel and i'm confused about the isbn <laughs> we have to have an isbn question um i've purchased two one for print one for ebook what price should i have the designer put on the isbn um yeah, basically, what about pricing on ISBNs? Yeah, you don't, <laughs> um, is, the, is the short answer. Again, you're not really producing your book to be sold in that way. And, and you know, so d don't worry about pricing at all. You'll set your pricing in the dashboard of the, 
you know, of the whichever um, of the suppliers you choose, either Create Space or Ingram Spark, presumably. And um, you should set it just to give yourself the profit that you want. And by doing so, you will probably more than likely make your print book uncompetitive in a bookstore scenario because POD just doesn't match that yet. So don't worry too much about pricing. You're going to be selling online more than likely at this point. I'd like to just come back to the fact that you've bought two ISBNs, one for, for ebook and one for print. It, ideally, you should have one for each format of the book. So um, generally speaking, you're going to produce your book in um, Mobi for Amazon and in EPUB for the rest. So ideally, you should probably have three and then you would need another one if you're going to do an audiobook and you would need another one if you're going to do say a hardback edition so the idea of the isbn is that if somebody is in a bookstore in 10 years time when we do have this wonderful ecosystem in place and they want to order the ebook um, in epub format but they don't they don't want the mobi that they are able to do that they're able to, to tell by the isbn which format they're getting so um now i know that a lot of indies decide not to have isbns at all and some people only have one for to cover all formats and, and so on i actually would argue that if you're only going to have one you might as well have none because it defeats the purpose of having it in the first place if you want to be the publisher of record of your book, then it's best to own your own ISBNs. But if that's not important to you, you don't have to own them. We do recommend that you do that. Yeah, I, it's funny. I've been thinking about this um, because both you and I have been move, have moved to Vellum for um, you know formatting our eBooks in the last month as well. That's a big change. Um, and I did. I went to Vellum because I was getting look inside errors on Amazon, uh, where if people went to view the look inside on the Kindle, they were seeing the formatting was all weird. And basically, it was an upgrade on well, what it seems to be having come from software development originally. Um, uh, an upgrade on the side of Amazon the file was no different my file was no different they just changed the as they do all the time they're putting through code changes into their system and the display with the interaction with my file was coming out wrong so um, I've republished books through Vellum and, and they're fine now and I was thinking about this because uh, the reason I had a job in IT for 13 years was that every couple of years we would literally implement the same stuff into the company because all the upgrades would have happened, all the changes would have happened. And I was thinking about this the other day because um, my husband bought an ebook from an, an older author, like a published, you know, a traditionally published book, and the formatting was completely screwed. And he was looking at it on the Amazon Voyager, Voyage, which is a, a new e-reader now basically and I was like oh my goodness because it was a big imprint like a you know Macmillan or something um I was like do you know what this means this means that I think we are all going to have to redo our ebooks every couple of years because the technology is changing so I I actually I'm gonna say that my pick and I'm kind of picking things for the next few years at the moment is the yes the ISBN will remain for a certain reason <laughs> but that what we're going to have is a case where um a because ai tools are going to come on board you know amazon's using ai big data that there will be ways in which all these different formats will be linked in different ways um because you like i've already i've republished my mobi file and my epub files for stone of fire 20 plus times probably over the last five years. Now that's a different version every time. Once was quite a significant rewrite. There's a different title. You know, there's the, all of these bo books could have been a different ISBN and yet they're not. So I- In the I, old days they would have been each- Exactly. Each edition would have been a new edition. I, I think that's definitely overkill now. I know some people mm. who are doing this. I don't think that's necessary mm. now. And as the author, you probably want the last one to be the one. But for researchers who might be interested in, you know, 50 years time after you're, you're dead, what Joanna Penn did, you know, when she started off and wanting to see the second one, the third one and so on, 
that's gone then it's once gone you right once you overwrite it in that way I'm, I'm actually very happy that it's gone I yeah know, it's, but... <laughs> I'm so. happy too but I mean it, it could be there I mean you know the people who downloaded it at the time still have it what I'm saying is that I think what we have to realize as authors is technology is moving forward all the time do not assume that just because you published that file once on Amazon that it will stay fine because as the readers change, you need to keep up to speed on checking on your files to see that they still are fine. So, you know, that's really important. And, and in five years time, I bet you, well, well you, you, you know, the first wave of eBooks that were done were done on pretty crappy HTML. And what's happening now is the readers have got so much better, the crappy HTML has to be replaced. So what we're going to see, I think, is a sort of um, a need to keep updating the technical side of things and it's painful but i think all the publishers are going to need to do it i think it's a really good point you're making yes note to self check old books and see are they a mess on, a, on an up-to-date reader i still have my trusty old kindle from way back when so i wouldn't even know you know and i think that's another important point that you're making which is you know test you do do look and and be um be a consumer of your own work in that way. You know, don't assume that because it looks fine to you that it actually looks fine across across the board. It's quite um, it's quite challenging keeping up with all of that. Probably once a year we need to do this. Exactly. It's a thing and make sure that everything looks as it should. But the other thing is the maturation of the space, of the indie space, means that we're getting better tools like a company like Vellum who have basically said, well, we could be the ebook formatting people and then their job is to keep their software updated. So hopefully you just need to re-output and re-upload. But having come out of software, I just, you know, five years in software is a lifetime and the first kindle ebooks were published about five years ago so i think what i think we're going to see a real like oh my goodness you know from traditional publishers you have thousands of these things it's going to be a very interesting next couple of years as all this happens so anyway i didn't want to freak anyone out with that i just it's something that i've done as someone who's been self-publishing now for five years well, again, I think it's likely to give Indies an advantage because we're going to care enough to actually look at it. So it would be interesting in, you know, in trade houses that have a huge number of authors, which authors actually get that sort of attention and, you know, which books get that sort of attention. And it, as Indies, it's another way in which the people who are, you know, taking care and keeping on top of things um, divide themselves off from those who aren't and don't and so yeah don't be one of the ones that doesn't be one of the ones that does exactly um okay as ever we're going to end up going to the full hour <laughs> because we're talking about different things that are quite interesting but that's why people like this show right um okay so um another kind of uh more newbie question janet says i'm self-publishing on Amazon and Kindle, but I see there are other companies I can use like IngramSpark or Lulu. Can I list my book with all of them? And what are the advantages and disadvantages of these websites? So um, the Alliance has a uh, download a uh, book, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, uh Choosing a self-publishing service will tell you about all the various options you have for your ebook, your print book, and and everything else, and you know what you want to do yourself, what you want to outsource, and what you should do yourself, what you should outsource, and how to choose a good service to help you. So, um, yeah, I think don't really don't set off on. You're going to upload to Amazon. Everybody does uh, for a while unless you've got a political reason not to probably um or or another good reason not to almost every indie is on amazon after that then you need to think about the amount of time you have and whether you want to use a, a distributor to reach those other outlets or whether you want to go direct to some of them use distributor for others so yeah if you have a look at um how to choose a self-publishing service it's free uh, for you to download as a member on the in the member dashboard and that will give you a good uh, idea of your options. And then if you have more questions, come back at that point. And also we should say that on selfpublishingadvice.org, there's now a watchdog um, service with um, ratings for the various um, services. So please um, go there and um, you can check out the two services you mentioned there. Go and check out Ingram's Bark and go and check out Lulu and you will see 
what what is recommended and what is not so please do that and also if you have um particular situations where you want to impact those ratings if you have experiences that you think honor should know about the alliance should know about please do send those in because it's very important that those ratings are trusted and you know this is authors looking out for other authors so really really important that you do tell us if there's stuff that's going on that we don't know about <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks for saying that. We really do rely on everybody's feedback. So uh, yeah, don't be shy, good or bad. We we want to hear it. Definitely. And I, I also now I'm having to caveat everything with, um, you know, this is my recommendation in within this one year period, because companies that we thought were good a couple of years ago are suddenly not good. Companies that were not good, you know, can turn into good companies. I mean, I've had to change a lot of my own recommendations um, over time. So that's why, you know, we're all in this for the long haul. We all have to keep up to date on things. So, I mean, definitely, sorry. No, go ahead. I was just going to say it's hard. It's hard to keep up. And there are a few people in, in the indie space and John Doppler who looks after, I'd just like to give a shout out to John really, um, who looks after our watchdog desk um, and heads it up and kind of, you know, helps all of us who are involved on the watchdog desk and keeps us all in line. And uh, he is, he's an absolute font of knowledge and he totally keeps up all the time. Also, David Gochran is a, is a good source um, when he's not in deep writing mode, which I think he might be at the moment of what, of who's, who's good and who's to look out, you know, who to look out for and who to avoid and who to, mm -hmm. to go with. So, um, yeah, yeah, we're, we're all only as strong as each other and author power has made a big difference in this space and, and hopefully we'll continue to do so. Okay. Okay. So a couple of really quick ones. Janet says, I'm a new member, delighted to have found support from other experienced self-published writers, which is great. I don't feel so alone. Thank you, Janet. Really glad that you're feeling part of the group. Um, Janet's an author of four self-published books, including two crime novels. She talks about all the things she's doing and Janet is doing a lot of stuff to promote her books. However, she's saying that she's having trouble getting PR opportunities. So building contacts with prestigious newspapers, book reviewers, bloggers to get her book recognized at a national level. And she says, how can I find a publicist? So um, the Alliance had a blog post about this recently on publicists, but Orna, what is, what is your advice? Well, yeah, there's different, different people within the Alliance actually hold different opinions on this, but um, a publicist is useful, is most useful, the kind of traditional publicist that you're talking about there, so attention at a national level as, as you're describing it. Um, that is really only useful when you your book is in bookstores. With our experience, and it goes across, you know, right across the board, genre writers, literary fiction, nonfiction, everybody. Um, unless you actually have bookstore distribution, getting articles in major newspapers, while it's very nice, it's very gratifying and, you know, feeds the ego and all that kind of nice stuff. And our parents love it and our, you know, our families and our friends. It doesn't actually move the needle half as much as a good digital marketing campaign if you're selling ebooks. So the general rule is, you know, for ebooks, digital marketing uh, for book books distributed through bookstores. Well, yes, you need to be in the papers then because the, the average bookstore person who's browsing in bookstores tends to get um, some of their recommendations from newspapers. But bloggers, uh, book bloggers are hugely important for indies and um, much more important to, you know, to get onto a good blog will get you, net you a lot more sales and to have a double page feature spread in the times. Uh, it's hard to believe that, but we've mm -hmm. seen so many times it is definitely true. Yeah, exactly. And I can attest to that having had, you know, national news and on TV and newspapers. If there is no button to click, then it doesn't convert into sales. Um, so yeah, it's one of those tough things. Um, yeah. But there you go. You've got, it's about, you know, what is your definition of success? If you are defining success by a review in the Sunday times, then go for it. But if you're defining success by making a living or actually making money back for your book, um, then spend that money on something else like a book bub <laughs> and the other thing to, to note is that the amount of space in all of the newspapers mm -hmm. is dwindling 
And the people who tend to get covered are almost invariably the large corporate publishers, even, even you know, quite well established indie presses that have had um, large prize winners don't get the kind of covers that they're looking for. It is extremely difficult for any publicist to get an indie, a particularly novelist, a particularly commercial novelist into the press. Uh, there's very, very little space for genre fiction anyway. And, mm. uh, you know, most of the space goes to big nonfiction history and political and economic, you know, that sort of book. And then after that, literary fiction by well-known brand name authors, mm. and then a little bit by debut authors and uh, a tiny, tiny bit on commercial fiction, usually with about seven or eight authors jammed together into one sixteenth the page or something. So in terms of effort, huge effort to get in and return, not very high. And so while it is nice, um, um, you know, I really would be putting the attention somewhere else. Yeah, and although at the moment, what's so funny, I, just, I actually did get the Sunday Times last week, and of course there's Lee Child, um, but there's also what's hilarious in Britain, I don't know if it's the same everywhere else, all these parody Ladybird books and Enid Blyton. So the number one hardback was Five Go to Brexit Island by Enid Blyton, and the Five Go Gluten Free, and all this type of stuff. And I'm like, this is what happens when a publisher owns an author brand. Enid Blyton's rolling in her grave, going, what? Famous Five did nothing like this. <laughs> but it's, have you seen Travis, that? Travis did everything the woman stood for. I mean, you know, really poking gentle fun and not so gentle fun at everything she stood for, having, you know, having cleaned up on her once, now they're cleaning up on her twice. <laughs> oh, they're cleaning up so much. But it, I found it hilarious and almost awful that the top, literally the top 10 hardbacks in Britain are parody books by Famous Five, Enid Blyton, and they, these penguin ones like The Husband, The Wife, and all, all these different things. And so I think we all have to, and I, this can be our final story, I think, but we have to all realise that books booksellers are booksellers that's what they do they sell the books as in they make money from the books they can sell so of course they're going to take a bucket load of parody Enid Blyton that people are going to buy to put in stockings and that and the Times is going to review Lee Child because that's how they make their money so that's why we have to kind of be a bit smarter and come in from another angle yeah, I mean, la last year it was colouring books. The year yeah. before it was uh, Fifty Shades. <laughs> yeah. you know, the book industry is being held up by non-books. <laughs> Yes, you're totally right. And, and this is the thing. I mean, yeah, the colouring book thing kind of disappeared. So those of us who have, you know, like we have our novels and, you know, fiction is a hard sell. It always is difficult, but it's also really rewarding and non-fiction is rewarding too. And I just remind people like one of my biggest sellers right now is my successful author mindset workbook. And, you know, I've mentioned before, if you have a non-fiction book, do a workbook. It'll cost you like 40 bucks extra and you have another product and people love workbooks. So this is what's so surprising. When you start thinking about what people want to buy as opposed to what you want to write, you come up with other ideas. And of course, I want to write my novel, so I'm going to keep doing that. But I'm not going to build a business just on writing novels. And I think very few people can make a living that way. I agree. And um, we have to do the old diversity of income thing. It's And it's fun. And I think, you know, the indie world allows this to happen in a way that it just wouldn't. And it stretches our creative boundaries. I'm doing things I never thought I was going to do, you know. So, um, <laughs> so exciting times. Happy, happy, exciting times. So we are not going to have one of these in December because it is Christmas, correct? Oh. So um, what, are, what are the plans for 2017? Let's move into what, what are the ally plans and what are Orna's plans for 2017? Yeah, 2017 for me, I'll be finishing um, Go Creative and getting back to fiction and looking forward to that. And uh, I'm trying to hawk a film script as well, which is related to one of the books I've been doing. And um, for Ally, as I said, we have starting the year with the Open Up to Indies campaign. And uh, we've got quite a bit coming on that, but we're really delighted about and upgrading our book. We'll have our update, of course, of how to choose a self-publishing service as well. And some new um, guidebooks coming on stream. And we are also going to, at some point next year, 
have um, a, a brand new, just new to self-publishing um, course, probably an email course or something like that for our members, for people to literally bring them as a workbook step by step through it. So it's a checklist you tick as you've done the tasks kind of thing. So that's in preparation at the moment. Jay is working hard on that and towards the end of the year we'll be doing a pilot project um something we've been talking about and joanna you and i've talked a lot about um finally we're going to do a, a pilot project about how we take self-publishing out to people whose voices we don't hear and um, people on the margins of society whose voices we need to hear and who probably don't know how to self-publish and uh, we're going to to um work out how we make that happen so Lots, lots going on in 2017. Yeah, no, no, I'm kind of the same. I've got uh, this new, I'm planning a new thriller series. And now I'm, you know, as we were talking about, I plan in threes because the most difficult book of mine to sell is Risen Gods, which is my only standalone and it is so hard to sell. So now I'm planning all my books in threes um, so that there's a trilogy. Um, so that's my kind of fiction side. I've got more non-fiction coming, including my notebook, my print adventure. I will be setting up a small press I will also be moving into an, a new author brand so I'm going to be working with a, another author on sweet romance so that is coming in 2017 um, I can't write it myself but I'm going to be publishing it so that's quite exciting and a whole load of other stuff uh, that no doubt we will be sharing the adventure as we go so I guess all that's left is to say a uh, happy Christmas to everyone, happy holiday season and a happy new year. And uh, we'll, I guess we'll be back in January. We'll be back in January, maybe with a, a new format for a new year. We're going to have a chat about that over the next uh, few weeks and just make sure that what we're offering is actually of most benefit to everybody. But we'll keep you all posted. And uh, yes, can I add my happy good wishes for a great holiday season for you all. Happy writing and happy publishing. Bye. Bye.